A great philosopher once said, if you want to feel useless, remember that they put parental advisory stickers on Cannibal Corpse albums. Hey everyone, Graham here. Obviously this isn't our normal setup. Uh, we're in quarantine right now here in New York City. Hope you're all doing okay out there and I hope isolation looks as good unto you as it does me. So that's what we're talking about today is censorship. And uh, since YouTube age restricted my last video on heroin and the opioid epidemic, I figured censorship was the right topic for today. And a f you parental advisory sticker. You're the reason my parents never bought toxicity for me. I've still never heard it, you know. So as long as rock and roll has existed, censorship has stuck its rancid hand into the communal fruit basket of music. In 1955, the Juvenile Delinquency and Crime Commission of Houston, Texas, that was a thing, banned more than 30 songs it considered to be offensive and obscene. Almost every artist on that list also happened to be black. In 1965, Satisfaction by the Rolling Stones was banned by many radio stations, and in 1968, more stations banned Unknown Soldier by The Doors because of its anti-war message. Even songs by The Beatles were banned by the BBC. Songs like Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds and A Day in the Life, they were forbidden for promoting drug use. Yep, Sgt. Pepper wasn't even safe. However, censorship had a real boom in the 1980s when heavy metal primarily was targeted by four wives of powerful Washington DC types. They founded the PMRC. The idea came to Tipper Gore, the wife of then Senator Al Gore, after she bought a copy of Prince's Purple Rain and gave it to her 11 year old daughter. She immediately regretted the purchase after overhearing some of the lyrics to the song Darling Nikki. I knew a girl named Nikki. Guess you could say she was a sex fiend. I met her in a hotel lobby, masturbating with a magazine. First off, why is Darling Nikki so unafraid of paper cuts? And second, who on earth could have ever predicted that a Prince album would contain references to... Sex. If only he had given us some sort of clue on previous albums like Dirty Mind or Controversy. If only he had named a song something like Jack You Off, so there would be some sort of hint of vulgarity. But this all flew over Tipper Gore's head because when she recounted her experience, she wrote, the vulgar lyrics embarrassed both of us. At first, I was stunned, but then I got mad. Millions of Americans were buying Purple Rain with no idea what to expect. Thousands of parents were giving the album to their children, many even younger than my daughter. So in her shock and embarrassment, Tipper Gore decided to make the whole country a part of her mea culpa. She started endlessly looking for crude content on MTV, clutching her pearls at the music video for Hot for Teacher by Van Halen. Eventually, the PMRC came up with the Filthy 15, a list of popular songs which contain references to sex, violence, drugs, or the occult in its lyrics. Among the songs were Judas Priest's Eat Me Alive, Motley Crue's Bastard, Wasp's Animal, F Like a Beast, Merciful Fates Into the Coven, Def Leppard's High and Dry, Twisted Sisters We're Not Gonna Take It, ACDC's Let Me Put My Love In You, Black Sabbath's Trashed, and Venom's Possessed. Now, I don't know how you appoint yourself the nation's morality police, passing down judgment on a list of songs seemingly chosen at random, but the PMRC took their case all the way to the United States Senate. They held a hearing to debate the merits of a proposed parental advisory sticker, which they suggested should be placed on any record containing explicit lyrics. Tipper Gore attended the hearing, as did Susan Baker, a fellow PMRC member and wife of former Secretary of State James A. Baker. And who better to judge the merits of heavy metal than these two? Really though, Susan Baker would sometimes talk about her good old high school days where she'd go out dancing at a club called Teenage Retreat. It was a neat place, she said. They played all sorts of great rock and roll. Chuck Berry, Elvis, Buddy Holly, and Fats Domino. We always had a great time. Ah yes, the good old days of family-friendly rock and roll, like Elvis Presley, who was censored from the waist down because his hip gyrations were seen as too titillating. Buddy Holly, who successfully fought a censorship attempt by Ed Sullivan over the song Oh Boy. And Fats Domino, who was censored for a song called Korea Blues because of its anti-war stance. Oh, and I nearly forgot Chuck Berry. Do you know what Chuck Berry's only number one hit was in the United States? 
It was a song that was censored. What the f was that? And it was called, I kid you not, My Dingaling. Let me read you some of these lyrics real quick. Then mama took me to Sunday school. They tried to teach me the golden rule. Every time the choir would sing, I'd take out my ding a ling a ling. So lecture me, Susie, on how offensive Judas Priest is when you grew up dancing to Chuck Berry whipping out his penis in church. And the hypocrisy didn't end there. Do you know what the PMRC dared to call the music that they were demonizing during that Senate trial? Do you know what Susan Baker, who just couldn't get enough of Chuck Berry working that delicious dong of his in the middle of church in front of the whole congregation, just working it, whacking it with the dexterity of a master guitarist, just spraying his rock and roll seed into the communion bowl in front of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, spilling that seed all over the place. Bang, you get some seed, you get some seed, you get some seed, going Oprah in that motherfucker. Do you know what Susan Baker called the music she didn't approve of? Porn rock. Now, the PMRC did face its fair share of opposition during the porn rock hearings in the form of Frank Zappa, John Denver, and twisted sister legend, Dee Snyder. And here's what happened. The PMRC proposal is an ill-conceived piece of nonsense which fails to deliver any real benefits to children, infringes the civil liberties of people who are not children, and promises to keep the courts busy for years dealing with the interpretational and enforcemental problems inherent in the proposal's design. It is my understanding that, in law, First Amendment issues are decided with a preference for the least restrictive alternative. In this context, the PMRC demands are the equivalent of treating dandruff by decapitation. No one has forced Mrs. Baker or Mrs. Gore to bring Prince or Sheena Easton into their homes. Thanks to the Constitution, they are free to buy other forms of music for their children. Apparently, they insist on purchasing the works of contemporary recording artists in order to support a personal illusion of aerobic sophistication. Ladies, please be advised, the 898 purchase price does not entitle you to a kiss on the foot from the composer or performer in exchange for a spin on the family Victrola. Discipline and self-restraint when practiced by an individual, a family, or a company is an effective way to deal with this issue. The same thing when forced on a people by their government, or worse, by a self-appointed watchdog of public morals, is suppression and will not be tolerated in a democratic society. Mr. Chairman, the suppression of a people or of a society begins, in my mind, with the censorship of the written or spoken word. It was so in Nazi Germany, it is so in many places today where those in power are afraid of the consequences of an informed and educated people. In a mature and incredibly diverse society such as ours, the access to all perspectives of an issue becomes more and more important. You say your song, Under the Blade, is uh, about surgery. Have you ever had uh, surgery with your hands tied and your legs strapped? So it's not uh, really a, uh, a wild uh, leap of the imagination to, uh, uh, to jump to the conclusion that that's about something other than uh, surgery or hospitals, uh, neither of which are mentioned in the song. No, it's not a wild jump, and I think uh, I, what I said at one part was that songs allow a person to put their own imagination, experiences, and dreams into the lyrics. Uh, people can interpret it many ways. Uh, Ms. Gore was looking for sadomasochism and bondage, and she found it. Someone looking for surgical references would have found it as well. I tell you, I can't help but just bask in the glory of these heroes of freedom of expression. But despite compelling testimony from these musicians, the Recording Industry Association of America agreed to the parental advisory sticker. And look, I should be fair here. There's nothing wrong with parents wanting to be informed about what their kids may or may not be listening to. I mean, without the parental advisory sticker, how would my mom have known whether or not slow, deep, and hard was suitable for her kindergartner? She couldn't have, it's impossible. And sure, the parental advisory sticker isn't too different from the ratings that you see in movies and TV shows, but one thing you don't do is slap a giant sticker right in the middle of the art of the movie poster. Sure, it's not a big deal to tuck away a rating somewhere, so if anyone's looking for it, they can find it, but placing what's essentially a do not purchase sticker right on the front of a piece of art, that's censorship. 
Because just a few months after the parental advisory sticker was adopted by the RIAA, our best gal, Susan Baker, publicly targeted Jello Biafra of the Dead Kennedys. In response, Jello's home and record label office were raided by police, who seized every copy of the album Frankenchrist, the art for which featured an H.R. Geiger painting depicting rows of penises and vaginas. Jello was charged with distribution of harmful matter to minors, facing a $2,000 fine and a year in jail. Meanwhile, the Reagan administration was selling weapons to Iran, planning to use those funds to fund a rebel group in Nicaragua. But no, heavy metal, that's the real problem. Anyway, the trial nearly bankrupted Jello Biafra and his record label, Alternative Tentacles. But he won. And then he decimated Tipper Gore on national television. Parents in this country right now aren't tuned in. They, they're not aware of what their kids are seeing on television and listening to, and they really need to so that they can nurture their child and protect their child. It's education for parents. Nobody, and we want to make, we want to create mechanisms for choice in the marketplace, not censorship. I think it's damaging. I think it's damaging both to a parent and to a kid to twist the uh, lyrics of a Metallica song like that out of context to try and tell a parent what that song is about when that may not be what the song is about as o at all. I don't think Mrs. Gore or anybody is so cool they can tell everybody else how to interpret a record, especially when the PMRC to. won't even tell us who their financial backers yeah, uh, are. Let Mrs. Who Gore backs I, it, Jimmy I, I, I'm, I'm Oh yes, there was a big, big backlash against the PMRC, not just on Jello's behalf, but in general. Danzig released the anti-PMRC anthem, Mother. No Effects recorded the PMRC can suck on this, with the EP cover depicting Tammy Faye Baker pegging her husband, televangelist Jim Baker. The Ramones used naughty words for the first time ever on the track Censor Shit. Megadeth protested with hook and mouth. Metallica added a PMRC warning to the cover for Master of Puppets. And Rage Against the Machine staged a nude protest at Lollapalooza. But again, censorship didn't end with the PMRC. Marilyn Manson was banned from playing in Utah after he ripped up the Book of Mormon on stage. And Bob Dole, who was a candidate for President of the United States at the time, used his platform to attack Cannibal Corpse. What to some is art, to our children is a world outside their limited experience. What to some is make-believe to them is the real skinny. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, continue. I mean natural-born killers, true romance, films that revel in the mindless violence and loveless sex. I'm talking about groups like Cannibal Corpse, Ghetto Boys, and Two Live Crew. The mainstreaming of deviancy must come to an end, but it will only stop when the leaders of the entertainment industry recognize and shoulder their responsibility. In response, Cannibal Corpse vocalist Chris Barnes said, it seems just a little senseless that a candidate for president would want to waste his time seeking out the destruction of freedom of speech. Look, there's nothing wrong with wanting to keep your young kids away from Cannibal Corpse, it's fairly reasonable, but calling the band destructive and blaming them for some sort of nationwide downfall of morality, it's, it's just incorrect. At their very worst, Cannibal Corpse is a symptom of humanity's sicknesses not the cause of it. It's not like Chris Barnes was Tolkien or George R. R. Martin. You know, the stuff that they write about really does happen. Remember what Elizabeth Bathory and Vlad the Impaler did? Yep, must have been because of all that death metal they were blasting from their castles. Cannibal Corpse's music has since been banned in Australia and Germany in the past, and in 2014, the band's music was outlawed in Russia. Lamb of God were banned in Malaysia for blasphemous content. Behemoth were banned in Russia for five years in 2014, and Singapore banned Watain in 2019. So the idea of censorship, it's not going anywhere. But do you know what happened in 2015? Tipper Gore did an interview with Rolling Stone where she reflected on the legacy of the PMRC. In this era of social media and online access, it seems quaint to think that parents can have control over what their children see and hear. But I think this conversation between parents and kids is as relevant today as it was back in the 80s. Music is a universal language that crosses generations, race, religion, sex, and more. Never has there been more need for communication and understanding on these issues as there is today. And in a sense, she's right. 
We do need to keep having those conversations. But in my opinion, the purpose of those conversations is so we can one day get past the social taboos attached to sex, drugs, and other offensive topics. We should talk to get beyond the surface level and into the subtext and context into what these artists are really saying with their music, rather than throw a big security blanket over all of it for the safety of the public. That is where the PMRC failed, and it's also why 20 plus years later after they disbanded, the organization is still hated by artists across rock and metal. And yet, we still have the parental advisory sticker, don't we? Yeah, you can keep your dumb sticker. People don't buy CDs anymore anyway. Thank you.